The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Andreas Benokritis, and I'm a product manager for Ansible Network Automation, and I will be your MC today. We're really excited to have you. Thanks again for joining us. Today's Ansible Network Automation webinar is entitled Ansible Network Automation with Arista Cloud Vision and Arista Validated Designs. Your presenters today are from Red Hat, Brad Thornton, and from Arista Networks, Carl Buckman and Fred Sue. Brad is a senior principal engineer on the Ansible engineering team and owns the overall architectural strategy for Ansible network automation and lives in the Seattle area. Carl is a systems engineer at Arista Networks, tasked with working on the customer engineering team and member of the Ansible working group, contributing to the development of Ansible modules and roles for Arista. And finally, Fred is a distinguished solutions engineer at Arista, and he leads technical marketing of partner solutions, net DevOps, public cloud, and Kubernetes. Can't forget about Kubernetes. Now, before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items, um, just so you all know how this works on this webinar platform. All participants will be on mute for the duration of the webinar, so if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask that you use the questions feature on the webinar app, and you can ask your, their, ask your question there. Uh, if there is time at the end of the webinar, we will address as many questions as possible. Um, and last but not least, and this question gets asked over and over, yes, this webinar is being recorded and we will be making it available on the training and webinars section of ansible.com by next week. So with that, um, let's, uh, let's kick things off. We're right here with the agenda. We're gonna start off with our wonderful friends from Arista are going to give you a little bit of, of uh, some history about Arista, the partnership with Red Hat, and then we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about Ansible EOS uh, from Brad, and then go back to Arista, talking about Cloud Vision and Arista validated designs, and and there could be nothing more in a webinar but having a demo, a live demo that uh, Carl will take care of. So. We have a lot to do today, so let's jump in. Without further ado, Fred from Arista. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. So just a quick kind of blurb about Arista uh, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with Arista. Um, our, our driving vision here at Arista is to make sure we're creating an amazing operator experience for, for the networking community. So you know, Arista is most well known for our data center switching uh, and it's powered by our EOS extensible operating system. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure we have a platform that, that network engineers are very comfortable using, are able to use the tooling that they want to use, such as Ansible, uh, to perform automation, to kind of have a, a, a great way of dealing with the, uh, the network state and the network configuration. And so, uh, next slide. As Next slide, please. As part of that um, experience, we've been defining a, oops, one too, one too far. Maybe it's got a lag, sorry. There we go. So as part of this uh, experience, we've been defining a network operations maturity model where we're seeing customers kind of on a, on a spectrum as to how well they're capable of executing uh, kind of a network operations. So you've got on the far left kind of your, your traditional network environment where you have people using the CLI and doing manual configs. Uh, and then on the far right, you kind of have where a lot of the public clouds and the, the hyperscale operators are where they're leveraging AI and, and predictive analysis and uh, network simulations. And kind of there on the bottom, you're seeing how quickly can you adopt network changes? You know, whether these changes are gonna take you years to do anything significant or whether it only takes you a few hours. But we realize that there's a whole bunch of folks who are kind of in between in, in this spectrum. And we want to start to codify um, what it is that defines different components here and, and how do we get customers to be able to move along this journey uh, and get to the point that they want to get to. Not everyone's going to get to the far right. Uh, maybe people are okay with just stopping at the first phase or the second phase. But we want to help customers get to whatever uh, stage of operational maturity that they want to be. 
And so that goes from you know, creating repeatable patterns, which is kind of a first step, um, trying to create a way of, of kind of cookie cuttering uh, a lot of your deployments, starting to automate those things. And when you start to automate, you really want to make sure you have really strong monitoring and telemetry and observability into what's happening as you start to automate really starting to the next phase you know get into actual workflow automation and uh, as part of that testing becomes important so you not only want to be able to automate your changes but you want to make sure that those automation changes aren't going to break things uh, in a dramatic fashion and then moving on to being able to leverage a source of truth for your for your network information uh, integrating this to your CI CD pipelines and other uh, tool chains and and you know really really getting that that operational change from weeks to, to days to you know even hours. Uh, next slide. So Ansible and Arista have a, had a really long-standing partnership. So um, you know this goes back to the very very early days of Arista. We've had support for automation through Ansible, uh, particularly with uh, EOS and and now with Cloud Vision, which we'll be talking about here. Um, we are actually one of the first network vendors who have uh, adopted the new collections framework, and we do have offerings already in the Red Hat Automation Hub. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we can have Ansible automate EOS, automate the, the switches and, and network devices directly, uh, as well as have Ansible drive our Cloud Vision management platform so we can actually leverage the best, best of both worlds where you get Ansible for your kind of config management, and you can still leverage all the great features of Cloud Vision. But as we said in the beginning, uh, Arista's EOS, the, our, our underlying operating systems, have always been built from the ground up to make sure that they're highly programmable and highly automatable. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brad to talk about Ansible EOS. Hey, thanks, Brad. Uh, hi, this is Brad. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking today. Um, about just a basic overview of how Arista and EOS interact with Ansible. And then I'm going to move on to some of the new capabilities we've got for EOS in Ansible 2.9 that came out last fall. Um, we'll talk a little bit about where we're headed in the future as well. Next slide. So we've started talking about Ansible modules as four different types. Um, and the reason we've started doing this is we want to differentiate between the module and its capabilities. So we've started grouping them. Starting on the left, what you're gonna see are the classic CLI and EOS command modules. These modules in Ansible allow you to make a connection to an EOS box and run, whether it be a show command uh, or a show command pipe JSON and bring that information back into your Ansible playbook to make decisions, runtime decisions, um, based on the configuration or the operating state of the box. In the second column, we've got both the CLI config and the EOS configuration modules. These modules allow you to push configuration to the EOS box. We'll go into configuration mode, we'll apply the configuration, um, and then you'll get feedback from the module of whether or not the application of that configuration was successful on the platform. Um, in the third column, we've got the fax modules, and this is really where I'm gonna focus more time today is on the fax and the resource modules. Historically, there has been an EOS fax module, which gave you basic platform information about the version, the memory, the number of interfaces, and in some cases, some very basic configuration information. Last fall, we've integrated the new resource modules with the fax modules. We've enabled the ability to gather fax uh, at the top of the playbook using the gather fax keyword, which historically didn't work. Uh, we've also enhanced the fax modules to return configuration data. The configuration data we return from the fax module is in the exact shape and format that the resource modules uh, require for their inbound payload. The resource modules, this is real, really where we spent a lot of time last year. Um, and what we found was um, we had the CLI command and config modules. We had the platform specific. Many of our customers and community members were still spending a lot of time building and maintaining Jinja templates for the purpose of building configuration text to pass to those modules and using homegrown or community or open source tools to bring back configuration data from their network devices and parse it into structured data, whether, whether it be JSON, YAML, uh, 
in an effort to really build out that source of truth that Fred mentioned earlier, whether it be a CMDB or an SCM. Next slide. So here's, here's the way the facts work now. Um, and this is a change with 2.9. So historically, you see on the right-hand side, we returned the fully qualified domain name of the box, the image, the model, the Python version. We've added a new keyword to the payload from gathering facts called Ansible Network Resources. And what you're gonna find here is that you have the ability using the gather network resources keyword that you can gather configuration information about different, different resources on the box itself. Um, we released interfaces, L2 interfaces, and I'll go through the exact list. But as you add those keywords to the gather network resources can, key, um, you're going to get back parsed configuration information as structured data from the FACT subsystem. Next slide. How the FACT subsystem is hooked into the resource modules. Every time a new resource module is developed, we enhance the FACT subsystem. So as an example here, we introduced the EOS interfaces resource module. At the same time, we added the interfaces keyword to gather network resources. So if you look deep inside the code path within Ansible, the resource module is actually using the facts module behind the scenes to collect the configuration off of the box, parse it, um, and return it as structured data. Next slide. Here's just a quick example of uh, one of the changes in 2.9. I don't know if anybody is familiar with this, but you've always had to have gather facts false on the top of your box. With Ansible 2.9, we can gather facts true. We use the Ansible network OS for the, for the host to determine which facts module to use in the background. And you can add the gather network resources keyword here and list out which sections or which resources of the configuration you wanna return parsed as part of the facts. Next slide. And a quick example of how um, the resource modules work in reverse from the FACT subsystem. So you'll see the payload here, the structured data on the left-hand side. This is an example of what the FACT subsystem will re be returning to the playbook author. That information can be passed without reformatting or structure change to the resource module. The resource module will convert it back to configuration text and apply the configuration to the box. I will note here that the resource module um, when invoked, we'll actually collect information, use the fax module in the background, and we basically do a Python dictionary difference between the inbound payload from the user, the fax we just gathered as part of the resource module, and we build a delta configuration. And that's actually what gets pushed to the box. Next slide, please. One of the major changes we've made with the resource modules is that we've enhanced the state keyword. Classically in Ansible, you're going to find a state of both present and absent. And what we realized talking to community members and our customers is that present and absent didn't really answer the question of how is this configuration being applied to my configuration on the box? So we've come up with four different state possibilities uh, with each of the race resource modules. And I'll go over these quickly. Merged, if you provide a state of merged, we take the user provided payload, and we merge it with the configuration on box. So if you have 10 VLANs on the box and additional VLANs are provided to the resource module, there it's an additive change on the configuration of the box. Replaced allows you to replace the configuration for a given resource on the network device. Closely related to replaced is overridden, where if there are multiple instances of the resource, uh, let's take ACLs as an example. If there are 10 ACLs on the network device and a state is provided of overridden and the user provides only two ACLs, the resulting on the configuration on the box will only have two ACLs. So extra configuration is removed with overridden and the provided is ensured to be in the configuration. And then fairly obvious we have deleted. Deleted will remove configuration that is in parallel with the scope of the resource module. Next slide, please.
So in Ansible 2.9, we released a number of different resource modules, interfaces, L2 interfaces, LACP, um, lag and VLANs, I won't read them all off. Um, the reason we decided, there were really two factors when we looked at what we were gonna deliver in 2.9. Um, we wanted to deliver the most commonly used and obviously some of the simpler resource modules um, to really build out the code paths inside, uh, inside of Ansible to, to handle the fax integration with the resource modules. And what we're working on right now, um, there's one missing here. Um, we've got static routes coming, ACLs, ACL interfaces, which is the interface specific ACL configuration, BGP and OSPF. Um, those are fairly complicated, so those are gonna take a little bit of time. Um, the one thing I will note about the resource modules is uh, we are developing at the same time resource modules for all six platforms that Ansible supports. So when you see EOS interfaces uh, delivered in 2.9, you'll find the other platforms as well. Same with what we're working on for this year. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Fred, I believe. Yep. Thanks, Brad. So, uh, I wanted to take you through just a kind of an overview of what Cloud Vision is and what it does for, for those who may not be familiar um, and how it complements Ansible. And so you look at Cloud Vision and it really has a whole bunch of different functions within, within a management platform. And you'll see some of this in Carl's demo in a little bit. Um, but here are kind of some of the key features. Uh, some of the ones that I really want to highlight are the real-time telemetry. So Cloud Vision is able to get real-time streaming telemetry from all of the EOS devices that it manages. So in real time, we can see interface counters or routing tables or whatever it is. Um, and so it's not an SNMP, SNMP polling anymore. It's actually uh, streaming the control plane uh, to Cloud Vision in real time. Um, it also has some change control features. So allowing us to uh, you know, create workflows to say, you know, use leverage BGP maintenance mode in order to intelligently upgrade or change certain devices in the network uh, and then upgrade another set of devices as well as a compliance dashboard so we have a way of assessing uh, compliance whether you're uh, adhering to corporate policy when it comes to addressing CVEs or uh, image software versions it even can track what bugs are currently out there that affect uh, your current network deployment and all of these things can complement uh, a net DevOps deployment where your network architects, your, your design architects are creating the network design in Ansible, creating the playbooks, pushing it through Cloud Vision, and then the operations, the network operations team can then review all of these things in, in Cloud Vision, leverage the change control processes there, and then roll out these changes. Next slide. So, Here's kind of a, a quick summary of a bunch of the collections that we've been developing for and with Ansible. Uh, the first one being Ansible EOS, which is the, the uh, modules that, or the collections that, that Brad was talking about earlier. Uh, and then what we're gonna go into now is uh, some of the Ansible CVP modules. So these are our collections. These are collections specifically designed to allow Ansible to, to work with uh, Cloud Vision. And uh, Ansible ABD, which is how Ansible can be leveraged to uh, adopt our Arista validated designs. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Carl. Perfect, thank you, Fred. <clears throat> this is Carl speaking. Um, so uh, I'm gonna dive into uh, specifically the uh, Ansible AVD collection and, and why uh, we uh, created that. So um, obviously, you know, some of the challenges we're trying to address is, you know, we're seeing in especially the enterprise space, customers are still doing things manually. Um, and, you know, other big factor as well that we wanted to address is not just about automation, but making sure uh, documentation uh, is kept up to date uh, as well. So as we've seen teams, uh, you know, adopt uh, automation, uh, you know, also came uh, you know, what about uh, all the documentation that comes with it? Um, also, the, the other key aspect that we're, uh, we're focused on is uh, not only delivering configuration management, uh, but the network validation uh, pre and post uh, deployment. And we all know that, you know, our customers use, uh, work in a multi-vendor environment, and that's why, 
you know, we we're looking at tools like Ansible that that can can do that for uh, the customer. Uh, and last point here is you know version control uh, of the configuration, making sure that uh, you know there's appropriate steps uh, along the way. So the solution really um, is bringing everything together uh, with Ansible. So your source of truth that you would uh, put in a uh, source control repository, uh, or you can uh, get data from external uh, database sources, uh, and you know Ansible being the glue to deliver the configuration via Cloud Vision or directly uh, via an EAPI to uh, Arista EOS. Um, and then we we also leverage uh, in the library that I'm going to demonstrate today uh, tools like Batfish and PyTest to do uh, pre and post uh, validation. So how do they you know how does Ansible and Cloud Vision complement each other and work together? Uh, so Ansible really is focused on building the configuration for all of the devices, uh, and then within Cloud Vision, when we deliver it to Cloud Vision, we we actually uh, visualize that diff uh, based on the live uh, running configuration of the box. Uh, so, and this really allows us to split up uh, the roles between sort of the design architects and also the operators. Um, so Ansible will push uh, what we call a configlet to Cloud Vision. Uh, in the case of Ansible AVD, we deliver a single configlet per device. Um, and you know, Cloud Vision role is to deliver uh, US images and extensions and patches. Um, when we look at, uh, in terms of the change control, so Ansible will generate the change control tasks on Cloud Vision. And then uh, within Cloud Vision, uh, we will go through the change control process. Um, and then finally, Ansible just helps us orchestrate all of the different components together for pre and post validation and you know, third party vendors. Uh, and Cloud Vision provides us that visibility and compliance dashboard to really aid uh, with, uh, with troubleshooting, specifically the, the telemetry that it can provide. So what is Ansible AVD and what we're trying to do there? Uh, so one is, is we wanna accelerate uh, the net DevOps adoption by providing sort of a set of, of roles and modules um, that are ready to be used uh, in the field. And, and this is actually being used uh, internally by Arista uh, AS and SEs uh, when we're delivering uh, some of our newer projects. Uh, so it's really about simplifying the network fabric uh, representation in a structured YAML format. So we try to abstract uh, some of the configuration with a well-defined uh, and documented data model. Um, it also produces complete device configuration uh, and documentation. So from a configuration perspective, it generates the full config of the device. And that can also be done uh, in day zero, meaning before you even receive uh, your equipment. So you're able to fully generate uh, your entire configuration uh, before you even receive uh, equipment. So then you're ready for uh, day two uh, or day one when you receive and uh, deploy. And Ansible AVD is also designed for uh, day two operations, which is what I'm gonna demonstrate today. Um, it's also very easy to extend and it's been uh, designed with that in mind. So it's using the standard uh, Jinja 2 templating engine uh, to build the uh, configuration. Uh, from a pre and post uh, network validation, like I mentioned, we're using uh, Batfish, uh, PyTest, and an another library called Word uh, to provide uh, testing of the actual, the intended configuration versus the uh, actual configuration um, and all of those tests are written natively uh, in Python uh, using PyTest. So uh, I'm gonna walk you through an overview of how uh, essentially AVD can be used together and we've published uh, all of these uh, examples to our NetDevOps example on the Arista GitHub page. Uh, so you can see this on GitHub as well and, and actually 
you could download it and, and work with it uh, even if you don't have a lab or equipment uh, because the, the first uh, three roles uh, actually don't require uh, any equipment but a, a Linux VM running Ansible in the, the, the various uh, requirements that are listed in the repository. Uh, so from an input perspective, uh, all of the uh, input that we demonstrate are, are done uh, statically using group and host bars. Uh, but of course, you could extend this uh, using uh, external uh, data as well. You would just have to, to integrate that uh, component. Uh, so the first role, really, it's it's about providing an opinionated data model on how to build uh, a leaf and spine fabric. Uh, so this, uh, so it, it inputs your group and host bars, and it generates a structured config uh, file in YAML format. Uh, and it will also produce uh, documentation in Markdown and CSV. Uh, the reason uh, for to generate this structured config is twofold. One, it allows us to naturally detect a duplicate uh, based on how it's structured. So if, if you enter the same VLAN twice, we'll, we'll actually catch it uh, during the stage of, of once it builds the YAML file. Uh, it, but it also allows us to build uh, documentation very easily. And also we use the same data to build some of our uh, post uh, validation tests. Uh, the next role that EOS CLI config gen its purpose is to generate the uh, the full uh, configuration file and also documentation uh, per device. Uh, the third stage is uh, a role that will execute some of our tests uh, that we have using uh, Badfish um, to evaluate to ensure that um, things are are kosher in our, our the the uh, configuration that we've generated. So it's able to catch, for example, um, a duplicate VNI when it comes to our e uh, VXLine configuration, or it's able to detect a, 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 an ACL that has a typo in it, uh, things like that. So, um, and it, could, uh, it can do many, many advanced things. Uh, the, uh, the fourth role here is the uh, configuration deployment uh, via Cloud Vision. Uh, so it will actually uh, take the intended configuration and deliver it to Cloud Vision. Uh, it will also build the uh, container topology in Cloud Vision that can be used to then deliver um, essentially configuration uh, to uh, sets of devices or uh, EOS upgrades. Uh, and finally, once we've, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the way we interact, then we go on Cloud Vision to uh, approve and deploy the roles uh, or the configurations to the devices. Uh, and afterwards, we can run some uh, post uh, validation uh, testing. So now, without further ado, I'm actually going to go into uh, my demonstration. And then uh, the first demo that I'm going to do is uh, we are going to add a new tenant called uh, Ansible demo. And I've purposely made, uh, so I've pre-staged the configuration because I didn't want to type all of this live. So I'm just going to uncomment it. So just walking you through. Uh, so this is the way you interact to essentially uh, build a new tenant. Uh, I'm going to define a Mac VRF VNI, and I'm going to define some VRFs with some VNIs and some SVIs along with uh, some tags. Um, the tags are used to actually filter to where they get deployed uh, from a switch perspective. Um, and, um, and you can see here, uh, the data is very abstracted. There's not any data related to the actual uh, EVPN uh, configuration, but we'll see that getting built. So I'm going to start off the job. So I'm going to run the playbook called DC Fabric Deploy, which this playbook essentially will go through and start building my uh, configuration. So we can look at this live and we're going to see the various artifacts uh, being created.
So we can see there's a number of changes uh, on the devices. So the first stage is to create that uh, structured uh, YAML file. And then I'm just gonna wait until we see some of the actual CLI configurations, and then we'll, we can look at the uh, diffs on those configurations. So we can see uh, we've deployed now uh, the uh, VLANs to, or we not deployed, but we pre-staged that configuration so we can see what it created. So uh, just talking about the abstraction that it provides, so we can see it created the layer two uh, VLAN, it created uh, the VRF instance. And if I scroll down to the other changes, I can see it created the SVI uh, interfaces the VXLAN to uh, VNI mapping. And finally, in BGP, I'm, I'm gonna see essentially the Mac-based VRF uh, and then the IP-based VRF uh, for eVPN. Uh, and then let's take a look at, I see that the role has finished and I can see I have a failure. So I can see that uh, that fish actually failed and that's because I had essentially uh, one of my tests have failed. Obviously at the command line, this does not look, you know, it's kind of hard to see, but it generates a full uh, web report. So I'm gonna go into the test report. Let me just refresh this. So now I can see that uh, essentially I, I used a, a VNI that was already assigned. So let's go and fix that in the data model and rerun the test or rerun the play to build the configuration. I also noticed my, my operator had mentioned to me that I, I not only needed to configure these VLANs on LEAF 1A, but also on 2A and 2B. So let me go and update uh, the relevant files. So now I'm gonna go into the fabric topology and I'm gonna look at how these VLANs get filtered so I can see on my LEAF 1A, it did all of my tenants for the web and app zone. On LEAF 2, uh, it was only doing specific tenants, so I'm gonna add the Ansible demo tenant, and we're gonna rerun the, we're gonna also correct our VNIs, so I'm gonna use something, so I can see up above, I was using the same VNIs, so I'm gonna change these to 40 and 41. Now double check that these are not in use. And I'm going to kick off uh, the deployment. So while this runs, again, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit and, and walk you through some of the uh, other file structures of uh, Ansible AVD. So in the, the way, and actually I'll start by the inventory file. So on the inventory file, I've, you know, describe my fabric. I have uh, two spines in my topology and I have my layer three leaves, which are, are categorized in different groups. Uh, I did this so that it allows me to potentially add uh, specific variables, uh, but it also, uh, in uh, from a cloud vision perspective, this also creates what we call a container. So then if I wanna do an upgrade on just these two devices, it allows me to uh, apply that to that specific uh, container. So if I map back to the variables and kind of walk you through, so the AVD uh, lab is really about the, the general uh, lab variables. So I can see uh, my IPs for my DNS, for my NTP, and then walking you through the fabrics variables, if we start from the top, uh, we will see that uh, we have summary addresses for my underlay and over, uh, overlay addresses. Uh, and same thing for the VTEP. So, and these are, um, when we define the topology, so over here we have a, uh, we define our spine topology, we can see that there's an ID. And essentially based on a unique ID, that's how we derive uh, the, uh, the correct IP addresses that need to be assigned. Uh, when we look at the uh, layer three leaf structure, uh, we have this section called uh, defaults. 
So this default section is really about when we build a leaf and spine fabric, uh, many of the values uh, are the same across. So uh, this is in order to um, reduce the input from the user, we enter it in this default section. So this is where we enter how we connect uh, to our spines, what uplink interfaces are used, uh, if it's an MLAC pair, uh, what interfaces uh, we use, uh, so on and so forth. And all of these values can be overwritten uh, based, uh, you know, if it's a, a slightly different switch type that has different interfaces. Uh, when we define the, uh, the actual nodes, uh, so we can see I defined the group here, what uh, VLANs and uh, though I allow them, uh, either by tenant or tag. And then we have, we define the nodes. Um, uh, some abstraction happening here, if I define two nodes, uh, this will automatically build an M-like pair uh, between these nodes. Again, reducing kind of the logic and thinking that you, the operator needs to do uh, in order to deploy uh, the fabric. And we can see here as well, you know, the ID assigned to each node, which helps derive and assign uh, IP addresses. So now I can see that the, the playbook actually succeeded and I, I've done my, uh, deployed the configuration. I'm gonna look at the test report again uh, from Batfish and I can see now uh, everything uh, from a pretest has succeeded. And then, and now we're actually going to go into Cloud Vision. Uh, so the first screen I'm showing here is the network provisioning. So, uh, and we can see if I refresh that I have some uh, some pending tasks here on the on the right hand side. And then I can see uh, which devices. Uh, now are tagged to be pushed uh, with a particular task. Uh, and again, uh, these are essentially the container topology. Uh, so this is uh, what we had defined in our inventory matches what we had defined in our inventory file. So if I go to my tasks here, I will see that I have tasks for a, a number of leaf switches. So I'm gonna go ahead and create the change control. So when I'm creating the change control uh, and what Fred had mentioned earlier, we're able to stage and apply these configuration and also add uh, various actions uh, to keep the, you know, to demo uh, as short as possible. I'm just going to add, you know, a, a stage and I'm going to move, you know, two switches uh, to a different stage. Uh, and I'm able to run, in, in this case, it's running the, it will run the deployment uh, in parallel, uh, but I can also stage it so that the uh, the deployment is done uh, serially. Uh, and we could add actions so that we can do some pre and post validations right uh, when we're actually deploying uh, the configuration. So some common actions, and this applies more to when we're doing upgrades, uh, is, uh, for example, enter or exit BGP maintenance mode, or let's say I'm doing something on an MLAG pair, I could also run a check of MLAG health. So now I'm going to go and review and approve this change. Uh, typically, that would be done by different operators, and the, the role-based access allows us to assign that to different individuals. Uh, so we can see now the the configuration that uh, is being pushed, uh, similar to what we saw uh, within, you know, Ansible, uh, within uh, our, our source of truth. Uh, however, now the config is actually, uh, the diff is based on the running uh, configuration as opposed to uh, the diff on the previous intended configuration. So I can go ahead and review all of my changes and I know that all is good, so I'm gonna, go ahead and approve, and I'm gonna execute the change control. So again, I can uh, execute, or sorry, I can approve the change control, and then I can decide when to execute it. So when it's executing now, I can see that the change control is executing stage one, and if this is valid, 
uh, it's going to execute uh, change to. Uh, the other piece, uh, while this is deploying, uh, that I want to demonstrate is uh, around our compliance and telemetry. Uh, so one of the operators uh, called us and mentioned that there's an issue uh, with one of our devices. So, uh, so this is the uh, the main dashboard of our devices, and he mentioned that on Leaf uh, BL1B that it's complaining that uh, it's missing one BGP peer. Uh, so that could be a number of things. It could be you know a connection that's unplugged or interface. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at, at how we can troubleshoot this with some of the post validation uh, role that we have. So I'm going to go back in Ansible and I'm going to run the uh, a playbook to validate uh, or help me troubleshoot what could be wrong. So, close validation. So, this playbook, what it actually does, it goes on every device, collects uh, some show commands. Uh, and then we, we've written some tests in both PyTest and Ward uh, to be able to evaluate uh, what the issues could possibly be. So now it's going through each device and collecting uh, those show commands. Um, we transform the data uh, first and then we, we do the validation and we can see, okay, it also identified a failure. Uh, so I can see this again in PyTest. So now I have a test report and I'm going to refresh this. So I can see it identified here some failed tests. Uh, alternatively, if I, I don't want to go to uh, this web page, I'm going to use uh, the. So I'm going to launch the other test that we've written in a library called Word. And now I can see. Uh, the diff of where my potential mistake is. So I can see on leaf uh, DC, or sorry, on the spine too, I can see I'm missing a connection. So this is based on my LDP neighbors. So let me go and see, and this is running in a virtual lab. Uh, so I'll be able to go and fix this. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and connect the missing link. I'm going to save this. So now that the link is back online, I can go to the telemetry. And I saw this live. I just connected it. In, uh, and that's the power of telemetry. It's real time. So I can see now that uh, I have my peer established. Just to make sure, I'm going to run my uh, validation playbook again and make sure that my tests uh, are successful. So again, we're gathering data. And wh while it's doing that, um, I just wanted to give a, a, a quick view. So the way we see customers consuming this, so obviously if they're just um, consuming it to, to play and, and learn uh, US and Cloud Vision, they can install the um the library via galaxy but it's really meant to be uh the project is meant to be forked and then customized uh so if i uh, go into some of the templates that have been written and how they're built so i'm going to go into specifically the templates for the uh the abstraction layer uh so how they are written is i have a base template for each uh, particular type of switch. So let's go in the layer three uh, leaf and spine. So if I scroll down, um, so we use a concept here uh, called stackable templates. So in this template, it builds another uh, YAML file and we can see uh, the primary key is here and then I include uh, sub templates. So this is, uh, makes it very easy uh, for uh, customers or people that want to extend it to add additional uh, data models uh, or additional templates uh, uh, to uh, Ansible AVD.
and so I see now that my uh, my tests have completed. So let's just double check. So now I can see that my topology is correct. All my BGP peers are correct. Um, and I'm good to go. And I my reports should also be up to date. So I have, uh, I can see that all my tests uh, have succeeded. Uh, so this will end the demo for today. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back to Andreas and Fred. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, all for presenting. We have lots of questions. We do have some time um, that we have in the queue. We've been trying to reply to ones that we have. There's just been a lot, uh, a lot on here. So we're going to try and go through these as like quick as possible. So we're going to kind of rapid fire these. Uh, most of them are for you, Carl and Fred. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and if you want to just unmute, I'm just going to ask them, ask the questions in here, and and hopefully they are, they're they're sufficient for answering. So the first one is, why not use the data model as the data source for post validation? Uh, so so we actually leverage the so for the post validation we actually use the structured data that's generated for uh, post validation. Okay. A uh, question was that are are you all using the the resource modules as part of this effort uh, behind the scenes or or where or is this kind of a little bit different? Uh, so when you're deploying with uh, Cloud Vision, uh, essentially the the only thing native to to Ansible is the uh, like the template modules to to generate the artifacts. Uh, and then when we're deploying with Cloud Vision, it's the Arista.cvp collection custom modules. Uh, if you decide to deploy via eAPI, so directly to the devices. Uh, then we're leveraging uh, EOS command and uh, EOS config to deliver the configuration. So one thing that I, I forgot to mention is that uh, when we build these configuration and, and what allows us to, to do specifically the pre-validation stage uh, is we generate the full configuration and then we do a config uh, replace strategy on the box. So we don't need to you know the advantage of some of the resource modules is more when you're doing a merge uh, type of configuration uh, in our case we're doing a replace so we're just using the the, the basic uh, eos config module okay and and to to go with that is there um you know the question was you know which callback plugins in ansible are you using as part of this effort if any I don't believe we're uh, using any specific uh, callback plugins. What we leverage from Ansible uh, sometimes is some of the plug, the native plugins to extend uh, some Jinja 2 templates. Um, and then we also, as part of the collections, we've developed also some custom uh, plugins as part of, uh, to extend the Jinja 2 templates as well. Okay. Um, will AVD be able to build an underlay net an underlay network uh, such as like BGP peering between leaf and spine, or do I have to build the fabric using Fabric Builder? Uh, so in in terms of AVD, it will do the complete fabric. So it builds the underlay and uh, overlay. So it it is a so Cloud Builder is more of a turnkey solution. Uh, native to Cloud Vision, Ansible AVD is another initiative to use essentially Ansible natively. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's it it builds to answer the question. It builds uh, everything, and then so right now, uh, it's based on the uh, our EVPN uh, deployment guide, and we are going to be. Uh, as now we're gaining a lot of traction internally, we're going to be adding a lot of uh, new uh, knobs in terms of what it can do from a configuration perspective. So expect to see uh, some active uh, release cycle in terms of uh, our config coverage. Uh, and if you have specific requests, we're, we're very open to you know, 
PRs on this repo and, or open up an issue to request uh, additional configuration coverage. Okay, great. Thank you uh, on that. And we're gonna switch gears a little bit to the, to the Red Hat side. Um, so, for, so for Brad, the question here is any, any difference in EOS programming, pr programmatic methods if using Tower versus the project? Uh, there should not be. I don't know that we've run these playbooks through Tower, uh, but based on how they're structured and the interaction, uh, there shouldn't be any issues at all. Did you have any other questions that you fielded that you wanted and that you thought were notable? Yeah, there was a question about the forthcoming EOS BGP model and whether or not it would support VRFs and import export functionality. Um, we haven't worked through the model yet for the EOS BGP model, but I suspect those capabilities will be in there. Um, when we build out these resource modules, we do open pull requests. So we look for community feedback on functionality and capabilities. So if you want to weigh in on the capabilities of the resource modules in the future, uh, the pull requests and the issues in GitHub would be the place to go. Uh, there was additionally a question about an EVPN uh, resource module. Um, I don't think we'd see a resource module for EVPN specifically. I think EVPN might be better suited for an Ansible role that draws on the resource modules behind the scenes to build out the EVPN config. Uh, for example, the EV, an EVPN role could draw on the interfaces, the L3 interfaces, uh, the VRF, and the BGP resource modules when they're available. Okay, great. Uh, we had we had a couple a couple folks asking if um, Carl, your examples, your YAML files, your examples are gonna are they open source? Are they on GitHub? And is there a way for people to actually try try what you did themselves um, somehow? Or is yeah, absolutely, a... absolutely. So let, let me actually, you guys can still see my screen? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the if you go to Arista Network's Net DevOps example, um, go to Ansible, AVD, EVPN, L3, LS1, the examples are all there. Uh, there's steps, uh, essentially the diagrams from today, the steps, of what you need to install, including that fish. Um, and uh, yeah, it will have all of the, the various artifacts um, and you can see what it generates. So one thing, I, 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 because the, of time limitations, uh, you know, you can dive into the documentation that it generates. So this is example documentation and this could also act as a, you know, a good reference guide of you know, building a EVPN uh, leaf and spine fabric uh, with Aristo. Great, awesome, thank you. I think, and one question that came up was, you know, we had we have a lot going on here with Arista. The question was, you know, is is Ansible a replacement, or what is is CVP a replacement for Ansible? How do they work together? Maybe we might not have fully fleshed out the 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 and right it's it's not an or it's more it's more of an and uh situation here yeah it's absolutely an and uh and they they work really well together and it's really so what we've seen the biggest challenge we've seen in enterprise going into a net devops model is they they typically ha especially the large ones they have uh different teams right they have the a team that does the design architecture and they have a, a large operation team that do more the uh, day in day out uh, so with cloud vision it really allows you to separate uh, those uh, responsibilities and you're able to you know through the the change control process uh, natively built into cloud vision that can be extended uh, into tools like ServiceNow. Uh, to really integrate with the the change control process uh, of the organization, I think the the second full is you know within Cloud Vision is also the you know the rich telemetry data that it's able to provide in combination with how you automate right so uh, and the various views. Uh, one thing that we didn't you know uh, touch on was the the compliance uh, aspect as well. So be able to to look for compliance. I can see here I have a version of software that uh, 
is impacted by bugs. Uh, so that's all natively built into uh, Cloud Vision. I think the, the, the third aspect is also, you know, driving, at least from uh, what I've experienced in the field, is if a, a user changes uh, a configuration on a switch outside of the automation framework, uh, and then you went and pushed with Ansible, it, it broke things, right? So uh, the compliance dashboard, and let's take a look over here, uh, also looks at the device configuration. So from a device configuration perspective, uh, I know that they're 100% uh, compliant with the configs that I've pushed from Ansible. So if someone were to change something out of band, uh, I would actually get notified uh, in this screen here uh, in terms of that there's something out of compliance. So I think that's another major benefit from a, an automation perspective and a pain point that I, I've felt before in the past. Right, and you'll probably see, and just to follow up, you know, we got questions around, well, does an Ansible do configuration compliance? And the answer is yes, but you know, this is a, what you're looking at here is, is an, op, you know, an operator, you know, operator's tool whereas Ansible is more of a developer's tool, right? Depends on who your audience, depends who you are and what you're looking for in terms of bells and whistles and knobs and whatnot, right? So there's many ways to do what you're trying to do either way. It's it's all depending on what, uh, what your use case is, what your experience level is and how it actually fits into your existing, um, you know, processes and procedures and workflows, I think is, is probably where we're trying to go with this webinar. Exactly, and, and like I demonstrated, I still, you know, we still do some post validation native to Ansible, right? So we, we really, it's about using, it's not one versus the other. It's really, okay, how can, you know, provide a really good operator experience from both the DevOps to the operator, not cater just to one, one group or the other. Perfect. Thanks. I think we're right at the end of time. We have some more questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to them. I would say uh, if you do have further questions, please reach out to your to your Arista sales rep or your Red Hat sales rep. We would be happy to answer these questions. Really appreciate you having uh, spending some time with us today. We will be sending this out uh, as part of an email. If you missed part of it, if you came late or you left early and you're not hearing this, uh, this will go out to an email distribution list. And we hope to have more uh, content coming soon between Arista and Ansible short, uh, coming soon. So thank you so much for joining us. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.